First of all, I want to thank you and, and Dom and the other organizers of the meeting, not only for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work, but also for organizing a very exciting meeting. So I'm actually going to talk in a slightly different way than what you've heard before. I also have about 50 slides, so put your seatbelts on. <laughs> what I'm going to try to do is show you a bunch of data very quickly, because the bottom line from my point of view is this stuff is snake oil. It does so many things that it's almost hard to believe. But it really does all those things. And it, to me, suggests how important this kind of stuff is to get out to the patients. So you guys have all heard about the Warburg hypothesis. I'm certainly not going to tell you about that. But when we talk about cancer metabolism, you're not just talking about the Warburg effect. You're actually talking about a whole bunch of other things. So there's so many things about metabolism in cancer cells that are messed up. And that's all the biochemistry you will get from me. Uh, so people say cancer is a metabolic, do I have to stand in front of this? I'm, I'm a, okay, sorry, I'm a pacer. So uh, people say cancer is a metabolic disease. Could be. But there's also lots of other changes in DNA. You guys have heard about all this stuff, epigenetic changes, genetic changes. And as um, Tom so elegantly discussed earlier, you've got this seminal paper, The Hallmarks of Cancer in 2000, very gene-centric. Okay, everything was genes. In 2011, they got a little bit smarter, there's more stuff there, and now we see, okay, energetics is involved. Well, I think in cartoons, and I didn't do well in biochemistry in class. So when I think of metabolism, metabolic pathways, glucose, I think of, okay, maybe it's a ball of yarn. Genetic pathways, I was a molecular, bi molecular biologist by training, I worked on all the growth factor pathways and stuff like that. There's another ball of yarn. But what I see now in the cancer field is in fact, that this is what has happened to <laughs> those two sets of otherwise separate pathways, and this is basically what it looks like to me now. You can't, I used to use a, a subway map of Tokyo to explain this. Uh, I think Jean Rowe gave a beautiful picture this morning of metabolism, how everything can turn everything else on and off. And in fact, you can't really separate the yarn anymore because the pathways that are what we call metabolism and the pathways that what we, we call growth factors and oncogenes and all that other stuff, they're incredibly promiscuous. They turn each other on and off all the time. And that actually is making things even more complicated than it was before, as if it wasn't bad enough. But it's also very exciting, because it means all of that molecular data that existed before, or I shouldn't say before, because it was after Warburg and before recently, is totally usable and totally fits in with a lot of the stuff we're doing. So now if you look at the, the, the uh, hallmarks diagram and you kind of start to look at, I lied, this, there's a little more biochemistry. And now you start to look at a little bit more of things that superimpose on that. It's funny, but an awful lot of those things are metabolism. Metabolism is affecting most, if not all, of those things. Okay, so in our lab we think of cancer as the perfect storm. I don't think of it as a metabolic disease. I don't think of it as a genetic disease. It depends on the genetic makeup of the individual. I'm sure everybody in this room knows of somebody that never smoked and got lung cancer and somebody that smoked four packs a day and died of 85 when he fell in the gym, you know, working out. Uh, the genetic makeup of the individual affects your susceptibility to all kinds of things, including cancer. There's environmental effects. Some of them are lifestyle, smoking, sunburn, chemical exposure. Some of them are things a little bit outside our control. Uh, the nutrition that your particular ethnic group follows, if you happen to be Asian, you're going to eat things differently than in the U.S., things like that. Environmental cofactors. Uh, your culture, your geographic location. And then there's two things that are my favorite, stuff happens. Stuff happens to ourselves as we age. And as we age, things just don't repair quite as well. And stuff happens in tumors. Tumors are constantly shifting what genes are turned on, turned off, et cetera. And by the way, when we talk about metabolism, and, and the, the metabolism is a metabolic disease, it's a genetic disease, remember that metabolism is how our cells use nutrients how our cells use nutrients are controlled by proteins. Proteins are made by genes. So to me, it's all mushed together. How do you treat the perfect storm? Any way you can, right? So you might have to target rapidly growing cells. You might have to target molecular changes. You might have to enlist the help of the immune system. Very, very popular these, these days, immunotherapy. My personal favorite is to target weakness that's, that's in those cells because of aberrant metabolism. So, simple question you've heard a bunch of times here. Cancer cells want glucose, drop the glucose. How do you do that? Enter the ketogenic diet. 
So a lot of clinical utility. There's case reports in the literature. You heard that earlier. There's anecdotal evidence. And heaven knows if it's on Facebook, it's true. Um, <laughs> it's logical. Tumors want glucose. Drop the glucose. How much more logical can you get? Thanks to the epilepsy community, very well-known side effect profile that's really very, very minimal, especially when you compare it to toxic therapies. But what we've heard from patients, I'm not a clinician, but sometimes if the patient's interested in doing this, they'll call me in because I've done the preclinical work. Um, the patients who, the, the clinicians say it's unpalatable, they'll hate it, it'll trash the quality of life. And what some of the patients, the ones that want to do this say is, this is the one thing I have control over. It's the one thing I can do for me with this disease. So there's actually a positive side. In brain tumors, the obvious seizure reduction, and uh, one of the things we've kind of been playing with in my lab is sort of a, a, almost a side project, is the protection of the normal brain. Yes, therapies hurt normal brain, toxic therapies. Maybe the ketogenic diet will help protect it. So in the beginning, we did a simple experiment. And I was brought into this by Zhang Rou. His lab was on the same floor as mine. And uh, I was talking to him about a talk he gave. It was very exciting. And he said, hey, there's this guy in Boston that's looking at this stuff in brain tumors, Dr. Seyfried. Uh, I got money to support a kid for six months before she goes to grad school. You want to try this? I said, yeah, sure. But I'm only going to look at it in the, with the standard of care. And the reason I want to do it that way is because if I don't do it that way, the clinicians aren't going to buy it. And it won't get where I want it to be. So his answer was, you know, whatever. Do whatever you want. So we did. And it, was, it totally, completely changed the direction of my lab because I wasn't doing this at all before that. So we took a cell line called AO2B4. This came from the fourth tumor that a patient had. This patient was treated with everything under the sun. This cell, cell line made every growth factor they knew to test for in the 1980s. We grew it in the normal media, which was high glucose. And then we tried a combination of 5 millimolar each, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate. And we saw what would happen if we treated those cells with BCNU, which was a chemotherapy, one of the chemotherapies this patient had. Here's the growth of the tumor with just mock treated. Mock means the, the diluent that you put this stuff in. Here's the growth of the tumor with the ketones. With BCNU, it lags, then it starts to grow. That's pretty common. But when we put the two together, it wiped the culture. So, wow. We didn't even have to drop the glucose, and the ketones are synergizing a drug that this patient had actually received. So we were told, rightly so, that you really shouldn't study this stuff in vitro. You have to go into an in vivo model, an animal model. We were in the process of making one. Uh, we took the luciferase gene, which makes fireflies glow, put it in a mouse brain tumor cell line, and voila, we had glow-in-the-dark brain tumor cells. Our experimental protocol simply is to take those cells. We put it in albino C50, C57 black 6 mice, interestingly enough. Um, they are immunocompetent, which is really important for some of the things we've stumbled on later. In other words, it's not human cells in a mouse with no immune system. These animals have an intact immune system. The cells are bioluminescent, so we can track the growth of the tumors. We used a product called KetoCal uh, for our work. It is a human, um, nutritionally complete diet. It comes in a powder form. You can mix it with water. The animals love it. Uh, they do just fine. It is four to one, four parts fat, one part carb plus protein, which is the, the classic uh, extreme ketogenic diet. And we let the animals eat as much as they wanted. So on day zero, we implanted the cells. We did a scan on day three, randomized the animals to whatever treatment we're going to use, checked their, their beta-hydroxybutyrate and glucose levels, and the animals were sacrificed when a reproducible set of symptoms appeared, and that was about 24 hours before they would naturally succumb. And this is the picture you get from the imaging system. The computer makes a cute little picture because us humans are a little dumb when it comes to numbers, but it will actually give you a quantitative readout of the tumor. Not to be not surprising, uh, based on the work that had been done previously, these are Kaplan-Meier plots. If there's anyone not familiar, the faster the line drops, the faster the animals are dying. Standard diet animals, ketocal treated animals, okay? Significant increase in growth, in uh, survival rather. When we use temozolomide, the chemotherapy of choice, the animals on standard diet with, temoz with temozolomide did survive longer than standard diet alone. Add ketogenic diet, it enhanced their survival even more. But this was the one that really kind of turned things around and got patients contacting us and things. The animals on ketogenic diet, uh, sorry, the animals on, that got radiation with standard diet lived longer than animals on standard diet alone. But the animals that got ketogenic diet and were given radiation treatment, actually 9 of 11 animals, the tumor completely disappeared. Now, if I was reviewing this paper, I'd say, you screwed up and the animals didn't have the tumor in the first place. Luckily, we have in vivo imaging. This animal was just got radiation, 
clearly had a tumor. The tumor grew. The animal succumbed. Here's one of the animals that was on ketocalculus radiation. The, the animal clearly had a tumor. It grew for a little while, then it went down. After about 100 days, I decided, you know, they're running around and they're, they're kind of happy and eating us out of house and home. Let's put them back on standard diet and see what happens. And we did that for another 200 days, and the tumors never came back. Mechanism's important. Mechanism's important for a lot of reasons. It's important to get funded, but it's also important to figure out what's the best way to use this. And if you do want to do something like Zhang discussed this morning, ketogenic diet and a pill, whatever, you have to know what you're looking for. So again, we turned to the epilepsy community. The epilepsy community had shown that insulin-like growth factor is reduced in patients that are on the ketogenic diet with epilepsy. Insulin-like growth factor is one of the growth factors known to be involved in the growth of tumors. This is immunochemistry, so green equals insulin-like growth factor. The blue spots are just nuclei of cells to show you how many cells there are. And here with the ketogenic diet, lots and lots of cells, so there's clearly tumor there, almost no insulin-like growth factor. So it's, it's knocking down one of, the, one of the growth factors known to be involved in brain tumors, and we've got information that it's probably knocking down a bunch of them. Cyclooxygenase 2 is a molecule that's involved in inflammation. We've all heard that, yes, the ketogenic diet probably drops inflammation. Well, this is one way that it does it. COX-2, when it's up, and again, green is COX-2, when it's increased, you get more inflammation. Uh, this is just with the blue stain that shows the nuclei. Ketogenic diet, much less. But we also had a way to use our fancy imaging machine to show it. There's actually a molecule that will fluoresce in the animal. The reason I like this so much is because you don't have to wait until the animal succumbs. So you can get more data from the animals, and I'm an animal lover, so this is very nice. You just give them a little isofluorine gas, they go to sleep, they go into a nice dark warm chamber, you image them, take them out. In three to five minutes they're up running around again. So you can get a lot more data. Here's the amount of COX-2 expression in animals on standard diet. It is decreased in animals on ketogenic diet. Animals that got radiation therapy, as you would expect, have an increase in this molecule that is blocked with the ketogenic diet. So the ketogenic diet, at least in these animals, is blocking a major um, mechanism through which inflammation occurs after radiation. There's a reduction in edema. What kills animals is tumor burden. Tumor burden is tumor plus swelling because there's no place for it to go. People, peritumoral edema is also incredibly important. It's why some people end up on steroids. It's why people have lots of symptoms. This knocks that down. We also looked at genes involved. These two are, G are proteins that are involved in how tight the blood vessels are. When the blood vessels, the blood-brain barrier is loose, you get leakage of fluid. These are pores that let water through, same thing. So, ZO1 increased, this is good. We finally found something that didn't change, and I actually felt a little better about that, because up until now, everything we looked at was bad for the tumor and good for the patient. At least there's one thing that doesn't change. That's kind of what you expect. But the aquaporins, also down. It's, it's known that increase in these is bad for the patient. So a number of genes, good for, the, good for the patient, bad for the tumor. These are mouse models, but you know that's basically this would be the model in a patient. Those changes would be good. Uh, we looked at angiogenesis. There is a reduction in angiogenesis. So the green fluorescence is CD31. That's a, a marker of the new blood vessels. And again, in the ketogenic diet, it's down. Looking just at how much green is there in five randomly chosen microscopic fields, significant difference. The Avastin drug that you heard about earlier is an anti-angiogenic compound. Well, there's such a thing called a tumor microenvironment. You've heard a little bit about hypoxia, I think. And one of the things that's actually gotten even more popular now than it was is the cells near the blood vessel are normoxic. They have normal oxygen. Further away, reduced oxygen. Further away, they finally die. So you, you actually have a gradient of oxygen in these tumors. Well, it turns out that if you look at therapy resistance, the more hypoxic, the more therapy resistant things are. So we looked at hypoxia. There is a molecule called CA9 that is a marker for hypoxia and it's also linked to resistance to radiation. Again, using our fancy instrument and a, a molecule that's going to stick to the CA9, you can see that the ketogenic diet reduces hypoxia. These are just controls that show that this data is valid. Well, hypoxia actually induces a huge number of changes of gene expression that promote tumor growth. So reducing hypoxia, very good. Here it is looking at the proteins. 
just to show that what we saw in the animal is, is correct when you take the whole tumor and grind it up. CA9 is down. A very important signaling molecule that gets turned on in hypoxia, called HIF1-alpha, is turned down. Another gene that is turned on, that turns on a lot of other genes, is called phospho, uh, NF-kappa B. When it's turned on, it's phosphorylated. That's also reduced. Total doesn't change, but the amount that's actually active does change. This stuff is doing a huge number of things. Drug companies are trying a gazillion ways to change each one of these things individually. All right. So we need to get mechanism. We went back to the lab and said, let's grow the cells in culture. Let's see if we can tease out what's going on. We're going to look at cell growth, radio sensitivity, and mechanisms. So in our mouse model, these are just growth curves. So you've got the control in black, the radiation is in red, beta hydroxybutyrate in blue, and then the two together in green. These are different amounts of beta hydroxybutyrate. And the only thing you need to see about these is the green lines are always lower. The ketones always potentiate the radiation even when the ketone concentration is too low to make a difference by itself, it is potentiating something that is absolutely the standard of care. We did the same in a human cell line. This is a cell line from a, a tumor that recurred. This is not the patient's initials, but this tumor actually came back after the patient was treated. And again, same thing. Radiation plus ketones work together. Trying to look at how, this is work done by somebody who was a high school student in my lab, so I'm very proud of that. His name is Alex Rossi. He's now a college student. He's still in my lab. This is a way to look at DNA damage, and all you really need to know is that this is the DNA. It's stained fluorescently, and the smaller the pieces are, the further out they are. So more in the tail, more damage. With beta-hydroxybutyrate, I know these numbers, this doesn't look very different, but it was statistically significant because the number of cells he counted. With no radiation, you really don't see much of a difference. With one hour after radiation, there's an increase in the DNA damage. Three hours, there's an increase. Five hours, there's an increase. And even at 24, there's a little bit of an increase, although it's not statistically significant. So it is, ketones are increasing the amount of damage that the radiation is causing, not by a huge amount, but by some. And it might actually slow the break of the repairs. The other way you can look at DNA damage is to look at a molecule called gamma H2AX. That's a molecule that sticks to the end of broken DNA and basically says to the cell, come fix me. Okay. So we looked at how much gamma H2AX there were in these cells, and we did it by something called flow cytometry, which is where you take the cells, you do the experiment, you hand it to a technician that knows what she's doing, she puts it through a machine, and she can get the readout of thousands and thousands of cells within minutes. And again, no radiation, no difference. Four hours after radiation, a definite difference in the percentage of cells that had damage. By 24 hours, it was pretty much repaired using this assay. If you look at how positive the cells were, not just how many were positive, but how positive they were, again, slight increase. So BHB does appear to be slightly increasing the damage. Do we think that's the only way it's potenti potentiating radiation? No, but it is one of the ways. You just heard about glioma stem cells. Beautiful talk by Dr. Brent Reynolds. Glioma stem cells thought to be in hypoxic regions, thought to be um, resistant to therapy, and therefore they are thought to be most important for when the tumors come back. Well, Dr. Reynolds was kind enough to share his stem cells with us, and this work was being done also by a high school student in my lab. Um, high school kids are great. If any of you are scientists that can get some kids in your lab, they really are, they really can be very good. These are two of the cell lines that he actually showed you data on, and what I'm showing you here is that as expected with any tumor, there's differences in how sensitive they are to ketones. This cell line happens to be more sensitive, but both of them are sensitive, and they're not happy with beta hydroxybutyrate. You can just look at that and say, that's, that's just not happy. You know? But does it sensitize to radiation? Because when we showed this kind of data, the first thing people said is, it's the stem cells that are resistant. What happens? So what Lena did is she seeded the cells, treated them with beta-hydroxybutyrate, radiated them, and then counted them. And this is what she got with cell line L0. So here's 5 millimolar beta-hydroxybutyrate. It does inhibit, as, as Dr. Reynolds showed. Radiation does inhibit, but the two together definitely work better. This cell line, which is even a little bit more sensitive to the ketones, inhibits even better. So yes, we are getting sensitization of stem cells when we add ketones to radiation. 
But there's more to a tumor than just a tumor. There's the microenvironment. There's all the other things there, including all these immune cells, which I don't remember well enough to tell you about. But they're shown here. So there's lots of immune cells. And if there's an immunologist in the audience and you have a question for me, I will turn you over to an immunologist. This was done in collaboration with an immunology lab at ASU, uh, Dr. Joseph Blattman and um, Daniel Lussier. And uh, we've, we've put it out for publication. I'm not going to show you the data because I'm not, I don't have the time. But what we found was that while tumors inhibit the immune system, so tumors actually do things to inhibit the immune system so the immune system doesn't fight it. And there are now companies making drugs against this and clinical trials for some of this. Well, there is a, from the ketogenic diet, there's a decrease of an inhibitory molecule on the tumor cells called PDL1. There's a decrease in an inhibitory molecule found on the immune cell called CTLA4. And some of these things are in clinical trials. The ketogenic diet already does this. Uh, one of the cytokines that um, is up to, to block the, uh, the, the um, immune system is decreased. There is an increase in anti-tumor cytokines. There's an increase in tumor cell killing. So people already knew that metabolism changed the immune system, but what we're specifically seeing here is it's not just changing the immune system, it's changing the anti-cancer immune response. Again, is it enough to do things alone? Maybe not, but it sure as heck is something that the company should think of adding to their uh, immune therapies because it looks like it might potentiate the immune therapies. So the perfect storm, how do we attack it? I just showed you data, and we're a small lab, that shows that every one of those things is affected by one thing, the ketogenic diet. All right, and that has led us to a clinical trial. Uh, the people in my institution were not willing to do a clinical trial. I'm a scientist, what do I know? And then two patients saw the radiation paper and said, we want to do it. Well, we've got really good clinicians, and they weren't going to stop them. They said, okay, it's safe. Go ahead and do it. And they responded so well that the clinicians turned around and said, let's do a clinical trial. So it is the patients that drive things. I am not a clinician. I don't do the clinical stuff. We have clinicians that are on board. We're using the four to one in addition to standard of care during the radiation chemo, and then we're allowing them to drop back to a one to one during the, the chemo portion because compliance is, is an issue. It's not easy to do, and we thought that might help compliance. So low carb, low sugar. What is an unbelievably powerful game changer are the pre-made keto ketogenic meals that Epigenics Foundation is coming out with that they're going to be using with the, pa the patients. That will be a huge, huge game changer for the entire field, in my opinion. We're looking at tolerability. Can the patients tolerate it? Overall survival? How long do they survive before the tumor comes back? Most importantly, the, the clinicians all said this would trash quality of life. So we're looking at quality of life, not only of the patient, but also of the caregiver. We haven't seen any quality of life measurements go down yet. Uh, changes in seizure activity, all the obvious things. Changes in steroid use. We're doing neurocognitive tests to see if this maybe helps protect the, the patient's normal brain. The patient is doing daily blood ketone and glucose levels, not urine, but blood. We are not doing calorie restricted. Why are we not doing calorie restricted? You're telling a patient that might have a year to live, year and a half to live, that you're taking away all their comfort foods, and by the way, yeah, we're also going to drop your calories down. No. Plus, the clinicians would say, no way. However, when the dietitian works with the, with the patients to get their ketones and glucose levels where they need to be, they are calorie restricted. They're not eating the same amount they did. So we're getting all the bang for the buck, or a lot of the bang for the buck, without ever having to go through the psychological issues or the IRB approval issues of saying, we're dropping. It's, because honestly, at the end of the day, we don't really care how many calories the patient gets. We care what the ketone levels are and what the glucose levels are. And the calories required to maintain those is going to be different in every patient. Uh, these are our goals. They're somewhat modest. Ketone levels above 3, uh, glucose at about 70. Patients, especially if they're, on, if they're on steroids, might not be able to get as low as 70. But even patients on steroids can be dropped down, some of them to 80. OK, yeah, it's better than nothing. Uh, and they're monitored for all the standard stuff. We're not the only ones doing a clinical trial. There are some other clinical trials out there now on clinicaltrials.gov. I'm very pleased to say that people are looking at different ways to do this, which I think is awesome. So my summary. We consider cancer to be the perfect storm. Tumor heterogeneity, if you look at 100 cells from a tumor, as somebody previously pointed out, a couple people, you're going to see 100 different genetic backgrounds. Uh, and the genetic instability just keeps changing that. It makes cancer a moving target. 
But that also includes changes in cellular metabolism. While the metabolism might be aberrant, it also can be considered a little bit of a moving target because the proteins that are involved in metabolism could change. Pluripotent therapies, that means therapies that have lots and lots of ways they work, are likely to be more, spec more effective, especially when you include metabolic alteration in your thought process because, as I hopefully have convinced you, changing the metabolism changes so many things in these tumor cells. Treatments that increase stress on cancer cells are going to slow the growth of the tumors and probably potentiate the effects of lots and lots of therapies. If it turns out that we can get the ketogenic diet to be part of the standard of care for all cancer treatments, then you can start to convince people to back off on some of the other more toxic therapies. But until you get the diet to be believed by the, by the medical community, I don't think you're going to have a lot of success getting large numbers of patients to prove the efficacy of this, of this uh, approach. Obviously, it has to be done in a manner that doesn't increase side effects. The ketogenic diet, if anything, reduces side effects in some of these patients. Dropping glucose is good. Dropping, raising ketones is good. Doing the two together is great, because I think each of those things alone does different things, and the two together does a huge amount. So the therapeutic ketogenic diet fulfills all these things, and I really think it should be used as an adjuvant for probably all cancers. Uh, I want to thank the people in my lab who do it. I sit in my office and attempt to find money. So I've got a grad student, Eric, Eric Wolf, and then Alex was a high school student, uh, now a college student. Elena was a high school student. These are some of the students that have been in my lab in the past. Uh, many collaborators, I'd especially like to thank Brent Reynolds because without him we never would have gotten into the stem cell work. Uh, the immunology work was done by a really good tumor in immunology lab. Dr. Zhang Ro is, was, and always will be my keto mentor. Uh, people have supported us. Uh, Dr. Q. Collins and the Epigenics Foundation, I think, is, like I said, is going to be a complete game changer in this field. Uh, another reminder that this symposium is shaping up to be absolutely fantastic, just from the list of speakers and things. If you can get to it, I would. And with that, I'd be happy to answer questions if there's any time. Did I make it? Did I make it? Hi. Um all the time, but I'm going to be getting into its use for cancer. Mm -hmm. And of course, our levels of beta hydroxybutyrate goals are going to be very different because for me right now, I just want my patients above 0.5, mm -hmm. maybe 1 to 2, um, to get them off insulin in some cases. But mm -hmm. here, we're talking about a big leap. Well, a study that I'm doing right now where we're putting type 2 diabetics and pre-diabetics on a ketogenic diet, and we're monitoring their ketone levels every day. One thing has really jumped out at us, and that is patients on the SGLT2 inhibitors, the, mm -hmm. like Invokana was the first one that came out. Okay. They have really high ketone levels. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that this has been a problem with the medication class, that you can get ketoacidosis in non-type 1s mm -hmm. who are taking these medications. Um, and it's been a problem, and we've had to pull many people off of these medicines because of that. But what we're seeing in most of our patients is not a ketoacidosis level. Mm -hmm. We're seeing them at these goal levels. Mm -hmm. We're seeing them between three and a half to six. Cool. And so, and of course, they also lower glucose levels. So I'm just wondering if there's any data or if anyone has thought about a marriage here between these medications to accomplish both of the goals that you have here? I think that's, that's an awesome suggestion. I know there are people looking at metformin, uh, but interestingly, uh, most of the people I know of that have looked at met metformin, and I'd like to if anybody would like to donate to the lab, um, <laughs> but seriously, the people who have looked at metformin, metformin actually has anti-cancer activity all by itself, so it might not even be the glucose. But I think marrying the ketogenic diet with other things that might increase glucose and, uh, sorry, decrease glucose and increase ketones is really a field that's just wide open and really needs to have more, more studies done. One of the comments I'll make about the, the cancer patients that people have to be a little bit careful of when you start mixing and matching is, is the background of a cancer patient and what's going on in a cancer patient is very different than the background of an otherwise healthy person. And I would consider di diabetics to be in some ways otherwise sort of healthy uh, because these patients are usually getting all kinds of other things. Their magnesium drops, you know, all kinds of things happen. So I do think that it needs to be properly vetted in a preclinical uh, setting 
but I also think it, it's going to be hugely powerful to do things like that and help these patients get the ketones and glucose levels where they want to be. I think it's, it'd be great. We have time for one more question, Dr. Jan. Great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Colin Chan from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, this is a common uh, question, and, and you know everything I'm going to say here, but just to reiterate it. Uh, I agree, ketones are good or great. Uh, low blood glucose is good, and together they're great. But I think we need to, everyone in the room and to other practitioners and patients, push that it's very hard to control glucose. Uh, I have patients that have ketones in the sixes, and their glucose is 100, and they're counter restricted. I have patients that are eating adrenaline and their glucose is in the 80s or even lower and their ketones are not so high. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know how that plays into things. So the thought process is high ketones, low glucose is better. But we can't always tell. So we don't want to stress people out. For instance, that guy who was in the hundreds, even though he was rolling in the sixes with ketones, was extremely stressed out about it, doing 50 finger sticks a day. And as Dr. Seafried mentioned, that's going to cause some stress. So we don't know what that's going to do with the glucose. So I think we've got to pick and choose our battles. I agree with what you said, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing better than ketones in the sixes and glucose in the fifties, but that's that's pretty darn rare. And that's where other modalities are gonna come into play, of course. I, I totally agree with you because two people eating exactly the same thing, doing exactly the same thing, their numbers are going to change. And one of the best things I quote this to everybody is an experiment you did on yourself where you stuck yourself multiple times a day and the highest your glucose was was after the drive to work. <laughs> oh I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Ah, sorry. Well, it's, his talk will be awesome, and that is a really important point. 